We will now go through some examples demonstrating how to apply the approach uh, that we just put forth for modeling mechanical systems. The first example that we'll do is a translational system, uh, a quarter car suspension. This diagram over here is a is a representation of of a of a car suspension. M2 is a one quarter of the total mass of the car. It's the it's the sprung mass. It's the mass supported by the suspension. Here, the suspension will be modeled as having some damping B and some stiffness represented by the spring constant K2. Uh, M1 is the is the unsprung mass. It's in essence the the mass of the of the wheel. And then we will model the tire as having stiffness K1 um, with negligible damping. Furthermore, uh, U will be the motion of the ground. Following the procedure put forth, the first step is to identify coordinates. Uh, in this case, we are um, identifying the motion or the displacement of M2 with the variable Y and the motion of M1, the unsprung mass, with variable X. That's their displacement. And we've defined up to be positive. In this case, and in, and in general in this course, we're going to choose that X equals 0 and Y equals 0 when the system is in static equilibrium. In other words, uh, you can sort of imagine that the, you know, the suspension and the tire uh, you know, are undeformed but if you set the vehicle down, uh, they will they will sag under under the weight of the vehicle, you know. And so by by setting uh, x equals zero and y equals zero from this point of static equilibrium, as opposed to from the point where the the suspension and the tire are undeformed, it allows us to neglect the weight of a, of the masses in the system. It allows us to neglect gravity. In essence, the weights are being um, offset by the static deflection of, of the springs. Uh, so, so there's weight there, but it's, com it's exactly offset by, by the force generated by the static deflection of the springs. In terms of assumptions, we'll assume linear springs and dampers and, uh, and negligible damping in the tire. The next step in the procedure is to draw the free body diagrams. Uh, in general, we need a free body diagram for, for each independent inertia. So in this case, uh, we'll start with M2. Since we are uh, set up our system such that x equals 0 and y equals 0 in static equilibrium, uh, we do not have to include the weight force. So the only two forces that will be applied to this mass will be the force generated by this by the spring uh, with stiffness K2 and the, and the damper. In general, a force generated by a spring will be in both directions. If you compress the spring, it will generate a force in one direction, but if you stretch the spring, it'll, it'll generate a force in the opposite direction. The way that I, I like to do it just to, to keep myself straight and keep me consistent um, is I like to uh, move my mass in the direction, uh, the positive direction I've defined. So what I do is in essence I imagine that mass 1 is fixed and if I move mass 2 in the direction of positive y that stretches the spring and so that means that it's going to want to pull down. And so I orient my spring force to be downwards. Similarly uh, with the damp, with the dash pot, with the damper, I imagine that uh, that M1 is fixed and that M2 is moving upwards. And since the the damping force opposes uh, motion, opposes the direction of the velocity, the damping force will also be downward. We can then express these forces using the linear models that we that we learned previously. Uh, specifically, the force generated by the spring is linearly proportional to the deformation. Uh, since this spring can move on both ends, 
uh, its deformation is going to be the difference between the motion of its top point and its and its bottom point. Therefore, the force will be proportional to y minus x. And again, uh, you know, the force can be downwards or upwards. This ordering uh, y minus x corresponds to to the downward direction as I've drawn it. Uh, in essence, if you imagine that y is larger than x, um, that that force will be positive in the direction drawn. In the case that y is smaller than x, then you're uh, compressing the spring, and then the force, instead of being down, it will be up. Similarly, the force generated by the damper has a similar form, except it's proportional to the relative velocities as opposed to the relative displacements. This your ability to sort of get the hang of um, defining the direction of the forces and, and getting the ordering between the coordinates correct, should it be y minus x or x minus y, uh, will take a, a little bit of getting used to, a little bit of practice. Uh, you will sort of have to, to sort of uh, explain it to yourself uh, so that you can understand it. Uh, there are uh, many more examples out there, in particular in the book, that I uh, encourage you to take a look at to get more practice. Next we will draw the free body diagram for the mass m1. Again, uh, we can neglect the weight force uh, because of how we've defined our coordinates. And again, there will be a force generated by the spring with stiffness k2 and the, and the dash pot. One way to orient these forces is to apply the same approach that we did with M2. That is, imagine that M2 is fixed, move M1 in the direction of the positive coordinate, which is up, and imagine whether or not the spring is, is compressed or stretched and, and what the direction of the generated force will be. An alternative is to just point the forces to be equal and opposite of the ones applied to mass 2. In this case, you can imagine if y is larger than x, then you're stretching the spring, and the spring is going to have an equal and opposite force on each end. So if I stretch the spring, the top is going to want to pull down, and the bottom is going to want to pull up. And so I can sort of uh, very quickly uh, apply those forces uh, just by making, you know, using the fact that the, the two ends of the spring, as well as both ends of the damper, will have equal, they will have equal magnitude but opposite direction. For mass 1, we will also have the force generated and applied by spring, the spring with stiffness k1. And so again, in this case, we can use this, this sort of approach where I imagine that the ground is, is fixed, I move the mass in the direction of positive x that stretches the spring, thereby applying a force that will want to pull the mass downward. And again, the force generated will be proportional to the deformation of the spring, where the top moves with displacement x and the bottom of the spring moves with displacement u. Therefore, that's the, the, an expression for the force generated by, the, by that spring. Taking these free body diagrams to the next page, uh, we can then uh, move on to the third step of the procedure, which is to uh, apply Newton's second law in order to generate the equations of motion. If you recall, Newton's second law is sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, and we will have to do this for both masses. So for mass 2, if we look at our free body diagram, the two forces are Fs2 and Fd. They are both downward, which is um, opposite of positive y as we've defined it. So uh, the two forces will be negative F S2 and negative F D um, equal to mass times acceleration where in this case the mass is M2 and the acceleration of the block um, we can express in terms of Y. So if Y is its displacement then its velocity will be Y dot the derivative of its displacement and its acceleration will be Y double dot the acceleration of its velocity. So there's an application of Newton's second law to the second mass. 
we can then substitute in for the two forces the expressions um, that we show in the free body diagram. And that, in essence, is the what we call the governing equation or the equation of motion for mass 2. We then apply the same process to mass 1, apply Newton's second law. In terms of mass 1, we have three forces, FS2, FD, and FS1. Since FS2 and FD are both up, which we've chosen to be our positive orientation, they will be positive, while FS1 will be negative. Uh, the mass of this inertia is M1, and its acceleration will be x double dot. So very similar uh, sort of form to the one we had for mass 2. We then substitute in our expressions for FS2, FD, and FS1 to get that equation. And then we're basically done. Uh, that's the governing equation for mass 1. Typically, um, it's common to rearrange the equations into a form such that all of the like terms are on the same side. So for example, all of the y terms are on one side and all of the x terms are on the other side. So if we do that for the governing equation for mass 1, we get something that looks like this. Um, so we had a m1x double dot on one side. We had a, a negative bx dot, which when we add it to that side becomes positive. We also had a negative k1x and a negative k2x if you distribute that k2. When we move those to the right hand side they also become positive. On the other side we can just leave um, the k2y, the by dot, uh, so those are both positive, and when we redistribute the negative k1 and multiply it by the negative u, that becomes positive. A negative times a negative is a positive. And so this is a rearranged form of the governing equation for mass 1. And similarly, we can do the same thing for mass 2. So we have m2 y double dot on one side. Uh, we have negative b y dot which when we move it to the right hand side becomes positive. We have negative k2y, which when we move it to the right hand side also becomes positive. On the other side, the negative k2x multiplying the negative x becomes positive. Same thing with the negative b multiplying the negative x dot becomes positive. And so this is the, the alternative form of that, of that governing equation. So together, these two differential equations uh, describe the motion of this quarter car suspension. You know, where in general we will need a one differential equation for each independent inertia. The last step in the procedure is to attempt to uh, double check things to make sure that they make physical sense. Um, you know, in general, what you can do is you can sort of substitute know the values for the masses and the and the stiffness and the damping and you can see if the if the behavior makes physical sense ie uh, you know the rate of decay or the frequency of oscillation etc in general for a, a physical system like this uh, a suspension which is in essence a passive system is that it it should be stable uh, the natural system um, the natural response of the system shouldn't blow up, uh, i.e. It, its, its, uh, its poles or the roots of its characteristic equations should have a negative real part. If you look at, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with, with some mathematical um, results, if you have a polynomial uh, such that all of the signs are, are the same, then then it, in essence, will be stable. You won't have roots um, with positive real part. And so what we would expect for a suspension system like this is that all of the x terms would have the same sign. They would be all positive or all negative, And all of the y terms would be have the same sign. They would be all positive or all negative, the coefficients. In this case, that is uh, the situation that we have. Um, so that doesn't necessarily 
guarantee that they're correct, but it, it gives us some indication that that um, that we did it correctly, that we, we were choosing the orientations up and down, and whether it should be y minus x or x minus y, um, we probably got that aspect of it correct. Here's another example. Um, it is a rotational system. In particular, it's a drive line with the wheel locked. So you can imagine here that this rotational inertia J is the inertia of the drive shaft. Possibly it could be the inertia of the of a transmission or element other elements of the drive line sort of lumped together. On one end of the of the inertia is a um, an externally applied torque, you know, either from an electric motor or from the IC engine attached to that end. On the other end, um, the other end is fixed, so it's not rotating at all. Um, and so that's the wheel um, being locked up, the wheel um, not rotating. And here we have some stiffness, so maybe the uh, the drive shaft is twisting, and so there's some there's some uh, stiffness associated with that. And then maybe there's some damping, um, either due to friction uh, throughout the system, where again, that could be the friction lumped together um, from various parts of the of the drive line. So the approach for for deriving the governing equation for this system is the same as we applied in the previous example. We first define the coordinate and its orientation. So in this case, the motion of the one end of the drive line, the angular displacement, is defined by uh, theta, where um, that direction of rotation is defined to be positive. We're assuming a linear spring and a damper, and we've also lumped, you know, the various inertias and and frictions and and damping all together into into single elements. The second step is to draw the free body diagram. Um, looking at our inertia, there's the externally applied torque T. And then there will also be the torque generated from the spring, the twisting of the spring and the twisting of the of the damper. So there'll be a spring torque and a, a damping torque. And just as we did with the linear springs, um, the torsional spring is proportional to uh, the relative displacements of the two ends. In this case, the one end of the spring moves, uh, has a displacement of theta. The other end of the spring is fixed. So the total displacement is just theta, or the relative displacements is theta minus zero, which is just theta. So the, the torque generated by the spring will be k times theta. And we've oriented it to be opposite of positive uh, theta. So again, you can imagine that you twist the system in the direction of positive theta. The spring will want to unwind, and so it'll generate a torque in the opposite direction. Similarly with the damper, except that the torque is proportional to the angular velocity rather than the angular displacement. So that's the free body diagram of our drive line. The third step is then to generate the differential equation from first principles, in this case, using a form of Euler's second law, sum of the moments equals J alpha, where J is the rotational inertia and alpha is the angular acceleration. Looking at our free body diagram, um, the, the, the external moments that we have are the applied torque T, which is in the direction of positive theta, so it's positive. And then we have the spring torque and the damper torque, which are in the opposite direction, so they're negative. Since theta defines angular displacement, its derivative with respect to time will give us angular velocity, theta dot. And the second derivative will give us angular acceleration, theta double dot. And so that is the, the resulting form of our equation, t minus the damping torque minus the spring torque equals j theta double dot. We can then substitute the expressions for Ts and Td that we have in our free body diagram. 
to give us this, which is the governing equation for the drive line. Again, it is typical to try and gather like terms on the same side. So here, um, we've got a negative b theta dot. If we move it to the right-hand side, it becomes positive. We've got a negative k theta. If we add it to the right-hand side, again, it becomes positive. And so this is our result. Again, since this is sort of a, a passive system, we would expect all of the coefficients of like terms to have the same sign, indicating that the roots of the characteristic equation have negative real part, so meaning we have exponential decay, not exponential growth. Since the signs are consistent, that gives us some indication that, that we did this correctly. Just real quickly before we move on, um, if we look at at the purpose of modeling a drive line, um, it can be especially important when we're dealing with electric vehicles. And the reason that is is because um, with an electric vehicle, oftentimes um, we don't necessarily need a transmission, um, and oftentimes we don't need a clutch. Um, you can sort of generate the the torque speed characteristics that you want. Uh, just by the, the way that you, you control the motor, by the way that you, um, uh, you know, command voltages or apply voltages or current to the motor. So you don't necessarily need um, a clutch or a, a transmission. The, the presence of the, of the transmission and a clutch tend to add more damping into the system. So electric vehicle drive lines sometimes have less damping than a than the drive line in a, in a conventional vehicle and this can lead to sort of more oscillation or more resonance um, in the drive line which is undesirable um, it can you know it can be felt by the driver it can be it can be even dangerous another aspect of that is that the dynamics of an electric motor um, can be much quicker than the dynamics of an IC engine. So um, you can generate the torque generated by the electric motor can be very applied very quickly. Almost you could imagine sort of a step in torque. And so that very quick jump in, in torque can, can excite high frequency resonances in the drive line. Whereas an IC engine is slower to respond um, and it's less likely to, to excite some of those resonances. So that's another reason why um, it's especially important to be able to model and analyze the drive line in, in an electric vehicle. In this example, we will model a brake pedal. That is, we'll determine the governing equation that models the, the dynamic behavior of this brake pedal. This is something that, that could be important when when designing an electric vehicle because electric vehicles uh, need to use a brake by wire, a brake by wire type system in order to allow regenerative braking. Uh, with a conventional vehicle, the brake pedal is mechanically connected to the calipers at the wheel, um, you know, through perhaps a vacuum booster or some hydraulics. Um, but when the when the driver presses on the pedal, there's resistance, there's mechanical resistance that gives the driver a feel. With a brake by wire system uh, in an electric vehicle you may want to do braking by running a generator and so there isn't um, necessarily a mechanical connection to the brake calipers and so what you want to do is you want to emulate that that feedback. You want to give the driver the same sort of feel um, so that's one reason why you may want to, to model the dynamics of a brake pedal. The approach that we'll use is the same approach we've been using. First we will define a coordinate system and its, or and its orientation. In this particular case um, we will define the motion of the pedal in terms of its angular displacement theta and we'll define uh, rotation downward to be or rotation in the clockwise direction to be positive. We'll assume a linear spring and a light rod. Um, by assuming that the rod is light, we're um, making the assumption that 
the mass of the pedal is concentrated entirely at the end. We'll assume that in static equilibrium, uh, theta equals zero. Uh, that is, the pedal is horizontal. And again, the reason that we do that is so that we can neglect the weight of the pedal. Uh, and the, the reason that we're able to do that is because the weight of the pedal is exactly offset by the force generated by the spring um, under static deflection. We will also assume small deflection. And the reason that we do that is so that we can make the assumption that the, that the spring sort of compresses entirely vertically um, and the force is applied entirely vertically. Uh, if we allowed for larger um, deflections, then we would uh, have to deal with the situation where the, where the spring gets sort of um, off at an angle, which would make the problem more challenging. The next step is then to draw the free body diagram. Looking at the pedal, we have this externally applied force from the driver. Uh, we also have a force generated by this spring. Assuming that the pedal moves uh, in the positive theta direction that will compress the spring causing uh, the spring to push upwards on the pedal. Then there's also the reaction forces of the pedal at the point where it's it's connected to the sort of the frame. Looking at this system uh, we can see that it's a rotational system. The, the pedal rotates uh, but we haven't defined any torques per se our free body diagram has only forces. And so what we need to recall is that forces induce moments. Specifically, the moment induced by a force is equal to the force times the moment arm. Um, where the moment arm is the perpendicular distance from the reference point to the line of action of the force. And that may not make a lot of sense, but I'll try and make it a little bit more clear as we go through the example. So we will also now go ahead and generate the differential equation governing the behavior of this system. Since it's rotational, we'll use the sum of the moments equation, where the sum of the moments is equal to j times alpha, where j is the mass moment of inertia of the pedal, and alpha is the angular acceleration of the pedal. We will choose to um, use the con the the connection point O as our reference point. And one advantage of doing that is that these reaction forces then have no moment arm. Since they pass through the point O, their moment arm is zero, and hence they don't induce a moment. These other forces, the spring force and the applied force, however, do impart a moment. We will define the uh, lever arm for the applied force F as R. Uh, looking at this force, it causes the pedal to rotate downward, which is in the direction of positive theta. So we'll define that moment to be positive. So this is the positive moment induced by the applied force F. We'll define the moment arm uh, for the spring force to be R sub S. This force causes the pedal to rotate upward which is opposite the direction of positive theta. So we define that to be a negative moment. Alpha being angular acceleration is the second derivative of angular displacement uh, equaling theta double dot. Looking at this triangle, the horizontal leg of the triangle defines the moment arm for the for the applied force F. It's the, the distance from the reference point O uh, that is perpendicular to the line of action of the force F. Similarly, the, the force from the spring has a moment arm R sub S, where it's the horizontal distance of this smaller triangle. The force generated by the spring, if we recall, is equal to the stiffness of the spring times its deformation. Uh, we will define the deformation of the spring to be x. So 
looking at at this that vertical distance that the spring is compressed will define to be x. Looking at this equation, this differential equation, it's in terms of sort of several variables. Um, the moment arms change with time, the deformation of the spring x changes with time, the angle theta changes with time. But what we would like to do is we would like to express the differential equation in terms of a single variable. In essence, this is what we call a one degree of freedom system. Its motion is described by a single variable. Um, in this case, uh, we will use the variable theta to, to reflect the, the, the motion of the system. So we want to be able to express the moment arms and the deflections x in terms of theta. And we can do that using geometry. Looking at this smaller right triangle, the hypotenuse is the length L1. You know, that's the distance along the rod from O to the point of the application of the force. Um, so that's the hypotenuse of a right triangle. R sub S is adjacent to the angle theta, uh, so it's equal to the hypotenuse times cosine of theta. The deformation x is the side of the tri triangle opposite theta, so it's equal to the hypotenuse times sine of theta. You may not remember from from geometry, but uh, there was a mnemonic uh, SOKATOA that that may help you remember which. Um, how to calculate the, the lengths of the sides of the, of the right triangle. Similarly, the moment arm for the applied force F, R, can also be uh, calculated as, as the hypotenuse times cosine of the angle. Uh, but in this case, the hypotenuse of the larger triangle is defined as the distance L2. So this whole distance is defined to be L2. Using those values and substituting in, we get a differential equation entirely in terms of theta. Basically, that's the governing equation. We will go ahead and rearrange it a little bit um, to, get, to get this form. Looking at this, uh, it's a little difficult for us at this point to to analyze this differential equation, solve this differential equation, because it's nonlinear. Um, it has uh, cosines of theta and sines of theta, which are nonlinear functions. So in order to and sort of double check the the results, uh, you know, looking at the sines of the coefficients, or um, you know, looking at the roots of the characteristic equation it's a bit challenging. Later in the semester we will discuss how we can analyze a nonlinear differential equation like this, um, but, but that's not something we will do quite yet.